separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You're never alone if you know Christ and he's in your life. Uh, we ask Gary if he'll come up now. Gary has served in the United States Army for 20 years, I think, 20 years, and a retired veteran of our country. And he's going to share with us today about that, about what God has done in his life. But we're certainly thankful for every person who served our country that we can come today and worship and freedom because veterans have uh, served our country and fought enemies against our country and died for the cause of freedom. We're thankful for Gary today. Gary, I want to say a prayer for you before you begin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for freedom. We have freely Christ. We thank you for the freedom we have in the United States of America to spread your word, to speak your word. Lord, I pray that you help us to speak your word boldness and with authority. Lord, just we thank you for Gary and how you came into his life, changed his life through the power of the gospel. I pray that you would speak through him today. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would place in his mouth the words you would desire that would speak to our hearts, that you open our hearts, make us receptive to the message that he would share with us. Lord, thank you again for all of our veterans. Thank you for the United States of America. Thank you for the freedom have and enjoy, and Lord, for the freedom we have in you. And I pray that we would, as a church, share your message of hope, the message of the gospel throughout this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Brother Roger. Uh, just I'll, I'll start off with every time Brother Roger talks, he either talks about his age or a grandchild. So I don't, I don't have any grandchildren, so I guess i got to talk about my age. And, um, I just turned 50 uh, last month, and I was doing great. At my 50-year birthday party, I was like, man, I feel like I'm 30, 30, 40 years old. I feel outstanding. And then like three days later, <laughs> I got the worst sciatica back thing going on. So if you see, I'm going to walk around a lot because it hurts to sit down and it actually hurts to stand. So I'm going to walk around a lot. So, so why am I doing this? Uh, well, I was, I, was, uh, I was told to. I was tasked to. The Holy Spirit just kept pushing me and pushing me. The why, I don't know. The why is up to you. It could be somebody in this room. It could be somebody that's watching this videotape. It could be for somebody that you talk to about or whatever. So that's kind of why the title of this message is blank. Uh, God gives us things to do and tells us what to do. A lot of times we don't know why. So the, the message is up to you and how you relate to it and how you connect to it. I just uh, I feel strongly that we all need to have a little sense of, of self-reflection while we do this. Uh, this message that I'm doing, it's going to be different. It, it's not going to be uh, maybe the way you're used to doing it. It, it could be wrong. It could be right. They're indifferent, I don't know. This is, as I went about this, it's like this is how it came up. Uh, this idea came to my mind of doing something about serving about two months ago. And it wasn't my idea. It was the Holy Spirit just pushing me. And I, I, I pushed back for about three weeks. But there's like almost every day there was something about, Gary, you need to do this. Gary, you need to do this. And I was like, can, can it wait? It's a little longer. And we waited a little longer, and it was, the, the timing was with Veterans Day. So we'll, we'll uh, make some connections with the military and us as Christians and how we view things and how we view uh, a, a whole list of things. We've got seven themes or topics we're going to look at. Now, Brother Roger told me I could take an extra half an hour to do this <laughs> since this is my first time doing it and I'm going to be slow. So thank you very much, Brother Roger. Uh, so we've got seven things to talk about. So as I talk about these, if you get bored and you hear I'm on number four, you're over halfway done, okay, of, of this. Uh, so... You know, I talk about how I'm 50 now. I'm, I'm not a young man. I'm not an older man, but I'm a young Christian. Okay, I, I've, I was saved about two, a little over two, about two years ago now. Yeah, two years ago. So my talking to you is going to be as a two-year-old Christian in my faith and my spiritual maturity. So I'm going to rely a lot about on my military side when it talks about serving. Does that mean I'm trying to? fluff up the military or, or say this is the answer? No. Uh, uh, I don't think anybody in this room has ever heard me boast about me being in the military or what I did or, or all the things I've done. 
So I've inserted a couple of things in here where I humble myself just enough so you know that I'm, I'm not trying to be boastful about anything in here. Uh, so let's, let's just see what you know God's put on my heart over the past few days. So we've got the 2020 here. We've talked a lot about prayer. We've talked a lot about prayer. We pray every day, all day long. We pray when we get up. I think you pray when you get up when you're older, right, Don? You're like, thank you, Lord, for another day. I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, you know, we pray before we eat. We pray with our loved ones when they come and they go. We pray at meals. We pray all the time. But I guess can, you know, ask yourselves, a ministry, serving God, how many times a day do you make a conscious effort to say, I'm going to do this because this is serving God? Uh, I don't know. I'm just asking you this. Again, it's a time for self-reflection. This is for the oldest member of the congregation to the youngest member of the congregation. It, it doesn't matter what age you are. You can serve the Lord in, in any capacity that he puts on your heart or that he tasks you to. And we're going to kind of talk about that just a little bit. Um, so we all have a ministry. We are all been tasked, told to make disciples. We'll talk about the, uh, the Great Commission later, but we all have a ministry. Our ministry is what we make of it. Uh, you know, Jesus' ministry was all about serving others. When he did a miracle, when he performed signs, uh, I don't know, Brother Rod, maybe I'm wrong. All of his signs was for serving somebody else. He didn't move mountains, crack anything open. He didn't do anything to uh, pump up himself. He was serving others when he did miracles. When he performed his ministry, it was about love and compassion and helping others and serving. So that's just a way for us to look at how we can do our own ministry is love, compassion, and helping others. And since we're on the, the topic real quick before we get into the, 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 the discussion here, the message is, we talked in just a second about uh, miracles. You know, Jesus performed miracles on having food come forward, people that were hungry. You know, the feeding the multitudes. Uh, you know, I've been uh, participating in the Slingshot, Slingshot Ministries uh, food program. And while I was sitting down going over this, it, it hit me that that food program is a miracle. We have this, this room about the size of this sanctuary that's empty of food. And then within, what would you say, Caleb, uh, an hour 5,000 pounds of food shows up like that. It's like God is working miracles in that. And it just kind of hit me. So that was on my heart to, to talk about miracles. We sometimes go, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about miracles. I haven't seen a miracle. You know, God's performing miracles in our lives all the time. God's mm -hmm. performing miracles in everyone's lives all the time. And that's just one example that kind of hit out on me here. Uh, so not to talk too much about the Veterans Day theme, but before we get into the slides here, is uh, uh, Veterans is about you know, serve, serving your country, and so that's why I'm kind of drawing the connection in here. Uh, has anybody in here served time in jail? <laughs> served time in prison? <laughs> uh, so when you talk about what, how many years were you in the military? Well, how many years were you in prison and jail? People that go to prison, people that go to jail, they lose their freedom, and they relish their freedom. They want nothing more. If somebody came into this country, into this area in Blanche, and forcefully came in here and exerted their will and their control over our lives, you would lose your freedom. And I just ask yourself, self-reflection, would you fight for that freedom? You would do anything you could, time, money, Words, deeds, actions, you would fight to get your freedom back. And people that know that are people that are in prison, and they're jailed, or they lose their freedom. So just think about that. We'll carry that on as, as we go forward. Okay, so Sonia's pushing me on. Thank you, Sonia. You must have a mic with Julie here. Uh, so, so transformation. First topic we're going to talk about is transformation. So when you join the service, you are a civilian. When you enter the service, you start to slowly become a, a, a soldier. So Sonia, the first, uh, next one, next slide. So this is me <laughs> in June 
in June of 1988, I'm 17 years old. Quite sorry. 17, June, 17 years old, 1988. Now, Don, if this guy came up on your doorstep asking for Julie's for a date, what would you do? Well, they run him off. Run him off. Burn him off. He doesn't look, you're, the, the judgment you give is, I don't want anything to do with it. I want this guy to be around me. I don't want him to be around my daughter. Okay, so one, uh, one point, a month and a half later, it's on the next slide. Look, that's what happens. I didn't really need glasses, but for some reason they said it wasn't perfect, so they threw glasses on him. I need glasses now, but I didn't need them. I didn't really need them then, but they said, hey, you're going to take a picture. We want you to look as dorky as possible. We're going to give you these this huge glasses. We're going to cut all your hair off and that 17-year-old that mustache and, and turn you into somebody new. Uh, all right, so enough, enough humbling. Next slide. So from the, from the military, again, this is, this is service. Uh, we're getting there. Everything is about serving God in all of this, okay? So just bear with me. Plus, I got an extra half hour so we can talk longer. Uh, mindset, you know, in the, in the military, we do away with our own self-centeredness. It's not all about you. Uh, everything's about, you know, for the, the good of the unit. Your, your character, you, you just, you show outward discipline in everything that you do. And you can talk about a police officer, uh, a teacher, any, any profession that serves the public, you could apply some of this to. Uh, emotional, toughen up, uh, endure the unendurable, you know? Uh, sleeping outside, sleeping on the ground, eating one meal a day, all that stuff. You're just getting tougher. Values, duty, honor, country. Your identity is more about the group than it is about yourself. So next slide. Let's talk about the Christian uh, form of this. So we've got some scripture in here, and I'll let y'all read through some of that as we go through this. Um, the, the main thing is, is that you, your mind needs to be centered on heavenly things, on Jesus, on God, on what would God want me to be thinking right now? What would God want me to be doing right now? It's not a self-centered uh, mindset, uh, your character, you know, you are uh, clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, gen gentleness, and patience, emotional, peace rules your heart, or emotional in the military, just for an example, you're supposed to be hardened, you're supposed to have a, a hardened persona, uh, uh, more of a tough thing, so you can endure things, as, as a Christian, you know, peace reigns within our heart, peace reigns within our thoughts, uh, Overall identity, you know, putting on that new self uh, of righteousness, striving to be righteous, striving to be holy. Use an example of, of, of God uh, for that. Uh, next slide, Sonia, please. Let's go obedience. So we've got these, again, the militaries broken up on the top there just a little bit, and the, the Christian view on the bottom here. Uh, so in the military, when I, when I served, when I was a leader, and I picked people for things, my most important quality was obedience. You could be the most physically fit person in the world, the strongest, the smartest, but if you wouldn't do what I told you to do, you were worthless to me. If you couldn't go do this when I needed it done, when I told you to do it, you were worthless. I would rather have a weaker person, a less, less smart person, that would do what I said every single time. And I wouldn't have to worry about it. Than somebody that I couldn't trust, didn't have the, the uh, wouldn't obey orders, obey commands. So in military service, you have less freedom. Actually, you know, we're supposed to be promoting freedom, instilling freedom, but people in the service don't have free speech. People in the service can't do what they want to all the time. Uh, we can't pick and choose what president we support. Uh, you know, we can't say, well, we didn't vote for that president, so we're not going to deploy because he wanted us to deploy uh, for this combat deployment. We can't pick and choose what orders we follow when a senior officer, a senior non commissioned officer, gives us an order. You, you, we, we can't do that. Um, so, when you talk about military leaders, the military leaders in the, in the service, they're like your mother and your father, you know, taking care of you. From the Christian standpoint, 
uh, do we demand obedience in our children? Or not, even a non-Christian standpoint, yes. When we talk to our children and we tell them what to do, uh, do you get frustrated when you say, hey, I need you to do this, and they don't do it? Pretty much everybody does. When you uh, provide for them, you, you take care of them, you go, you know what, I'm going to get you something nice. And then they end up not doing something. You get angry and you get frustrated. You get angry and you get frustrated because they are dishonest with you, they're disloyal, they're disrespectful. You can even say they're, they're dissing you. They're doing all the disses. Okay? So if we look at from uh, Ten Commandments uh, side, so... I don't know, you know, as a young Christian, this kind of hit me the other, the other week or so, that, you know, the first four commandments are all, all about worshiping God, how you're supposed to uh, exalt him, what, to what level. And as, we, as it transitions, that um, the fifth commandment is all about honoring your parents. And Br Brother Roger said at last Wednesday's service about the center of all obedience is in the household. So it's a little plug for your Wednesday night. Uh, the sermon, Brother Roger. And it it kind of hit me. If our households can't follow instructions, can't follow orders, the society breaks down. That's, that's where it starts. Um, so if you look at it from our Heavenly Father, God is our Heavenly Father. If we're told to obey, to honor our father and our mother, honor is so much more about doing what your, your mother and your father told you to do. It's not just about obeying a very specific what they tell you to do. Honor is about how you act, how you talk, how you present yourself to others when they know who you are. If they know that you are Don Franklin's son or Don Franklin's daughter, everybody knows that, and you have to present yourself in, in the way you act, the way you talk, in a manner that brings honor to that family. Well, we're, uh, we're a church family. The way we act and the way we talk should bring honor to our Heavenly Father in, in all, of, all that we do. Uh, when I wasn't a Christian, and I don't like to talk about it when I wasn't a Christian. When I wasn't a Christian, <coughs> I looked at Christians at a higher, um, a, a higher level of what my expectation was for them, for their values, for their norms, for their beliefs. And if... If they didn't do something that in my limited knowledge of what God was telling them to do, I, I would know automatically, yep, they're not, they're, they're not, they're not being good Christians. They're, they're not doing this, because I, I think they're supposed to do that, and they're not doing that. You know, they're making fun of somebody, or they're being a racist, but they talk the, one minute later about how a good Christian they are. You know, so uh, that, that's how, again, about presenting yourself, that's how you're honoring your, your, your church family and honoring your Heavenly Father. Uh, so we, we talk about Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, 6. You know, it's, it's walking in obedience to God every, every day, every minute, uh, every hour. And you're going to have good times and bad times. Let others hear about those good times and those bad times. Let other people know how God is working in your life during those good times and those bad times. Uh, you need to be a, a voice for those that are around you, that you know aren't saved, are lost, are Christians that have kind of fallen to the wayside, it's, it's speak openly about your faith and what God's doing. And when something good happens to you, or you do something, and they say, hey, that was a good job on that, or you did good, just you know, give God the credit in some manner, in some way. And that's giving honor to your Heavenly Father. Uh, so, we talk about Serving obediently, and it's, it's, it's hard to do that from a human perspective when you don't know why. You kind of know what you're supposed to do, but you don't know why. We always want to ask questions, especially our children. Why? Why do we need to do that? Why did you tell me? Why do we need to meet here instead of here? Why did you buy this instead of that? We do the same thing to God. We ask him why all the time. You know, I ask him, why do I need to do this? And he was silent. He just told me to do it. So that's, that's hard. It's still hard for me as a, a young Christian <coughs> to not question so much why. What is God's purpose in this? And we'll talk a, we'll talk a little bit more about purpose here in a second. Uh, but 
doing something when you don't understand, it's all about faith. It's having faith that God's telling you to do this for the right reason. Uh, next slide, Sonia, please. So we talk about faith, and from a military standpoint, just to kind of wrap our heads in that and use these two in, in conjunction with each other. Uh, from an equipment standpoint, it's trust. From the military, you've got to trust equipment with your life. I, you, a military service member that's jumping out of an airplane, you know, getting shot at, setting in an explosive and using a blasting shield 10 feet from it, you trust that equipment, that piece of plastic, that piece of metal, that piece of Kevlar, you trust that with your life. And you go, yep, uh, they told me it'll work, I'll just use it. And that's why it's a young man's game, I guess, being in the military. You just do what you're told. Uh, faith in each other. If I'm, if I'm moving under fire and Steve's over here shooting, I have to trust him that he's going to expose himself just enough and risk himself just enough to give me covering fire so I can get up and move. That's trusting each other. Trusting in your leaders is your soldiers trusting you when you tell them, when you give them a command, that, they, that you have their best interests in mind. And again, they may not know the reason. They may not know the purpose. But they have to trust you as a leader that your command is something that is, is, is for the betterment of the mission and the, the continuing of the mission. So if we take this from uh, the Christian perspective, from uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, you know, in this one, it talks about uh, faith in action. This is the one where uh, Paul's talking about by faith. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, Noah did this. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Moses did this. These were all faith in action. They just didn't sit and go, I have faith in God. They had faith in God and did what, he, they, what God told them to do. And in a lot of those cases, if you read that, that chapter, they had no idea why. God just told them to do something. And that's faith in action. Again, it's not knowing the purpose, but knowing that you've got to do something. Either through the command or the Holy Spirit pushing you to do something. Uh, so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I, I love the Holy Spirit. I love it when I feel just the, the God in my life in that way. That is that is really, 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 really special to me. Uh, I don't feel it all the time. I wish, be, I wish I could feel it more. I wish, I don't know if everybody in this room, like if you had a, we could raise hands and say, how often do you feel the Holy Spirit? I don't know what it would be. I know me, I wish I could feel it more. I wish I could see feel God telling me what to do at, at the right time. Uh, but just because we don't feel that doesn't mean it's there. And the Holy Spirit is, is something that's really, really powerful. But again, you're not going to know why, what you need to do. So if we look at this verse in Acts chapter 20, verse 22, Paul is getting ready to go to Jerusalem. And he knows bad things are going to happen. Uh, he's telling some people, and now compelled by the Spirit... So the Holy Spirit is compelling him. It's pushing him to do this. He doesn't want to do it. I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. He doesn't know. He doesn't know his purpose. He's like, I'm doing great things in Asia Minor. I'm doing great things in Macedonia. Can I keep doing these great things? Building more churches. Building them up. That's, that's what I think my mission and purpose is. That's what you told me to do a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. But now you're telling me to go back to Jerusalem where they hate me? I don't know why. I don't understand. But what does he do? He does it. He does it because he's, he's, he's obedient. He's, he's following orders. He's doing what God is telling him to do. Uh, and we all know now after the fact that it's, it's a beautiful thing that Paul goes through that, that he, he suffers that for others. You know, some of his, his best letters, some of, his, some of the, his best works came when he was in prison. He was able to reach governors, kings, and talk about the gospel to people that he wouldn't be able to have reached if he was in Macedonia or Asia Minor, those types of things. And he didn't know why, but he just did it. Uh, we have, you know, obviously the free will. Free will to accept God, to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But it doesn't end there. 
free will happens every single day when we get told what to do, know what we're supposed to do, and don't do it. That's our free will. I, I had free will for three weeks to not do this and say, you know what? Somebody else can do that. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want people looking at me going, why is he talking like in this way or judging me? I'd rather not have that. So the free will is still a, a, a thing that we can go back on and say, I don't want to do this. It'll go away. That feeling will go away. The feeling of the Holy Spirit pushing me to do this will go away. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, I wanted to share one thing real quick. I kind of talked about this with Julie and, and her children uh, a few weeks ago when we were doing like a Wednesday night, you know, our own family service. The Holy Spirit is a, is a powerful thing, and you don't understand. Our, our neighbor about six months ago had her husband died in his, their backyard. We didn't know that at the time. Our, another neighbor came to our house and said, hey, Mrs. So-and-so across the street is yelling at her husband. She's frantic. She's screaming. And so Julie's a nurse, nurse practitioner, so she runs over there, and I'm okay, I'll, I'll go too. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll go too. We go over there, and it's obvious that this man had already passed away. He's already died. He's laying on the ground. His wife is hysterical, in tears. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying, Gary, pray. After we, we had been there for about three to five minutes. And I said, no. I don't. I can't. I don't want to. So what opportunity did I miss in that? I was told what to do. I didn't know why. I was more worried about, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to pray for a dead, I've never prayed for a dead person before. Uh, I don't know what to say. I don't know this lady. I've only said hi to her. I've given her some, some vegetables across the street. That's about it. Uh, I don't know anything. Excuses, excuses, excuses. So... We can, I, I can go back in time and go, well, why did I need to do this? Was it for her? Was it for Julie? Was it for me? Was it for a neighbor that was peering over the fence? Going, what's going on? And that act touches them in a manner that brings them back to their Christian faith stronger or causes them to finally accept uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Who knows? I don't know. I just know I, it is a missed opportunity for me to do what God told me to do. So I just kind of wanted to, to share that with you. So, just think about how you respond to the Holy Spirit in your life, uh, you know, as it happens day to day, you know. Again, we don't know why. You, you, you don't know why, so just, you, as we do this, we need to try our best to do it. Uh, next slide, Sonia. Okay, we'll go through these quickly, because I know we're kind of running on time, and uh, I still got 45 minutes, though. So. Uh, so, military orders. Again, bear with me. You've got written orders, you've got verbal orders. In the military, they're big about orders. They tell you what to do. If they've got time, they'll write it on a piece of paper, one paragraph long or 30 pages long. And you've got to figure out what, what to do and how to do it. Every single time, bar none, the first thing I do when somebody hands me a 30-page operation order, I go to my mission statement. Your mission statement is like what your five W's. What are you supposed to do? How do you do it? When? Where and why. Basically, it's a task and a purpose in there somehow. What are you doing and why are you doing it? We've talked about that. What are you doing and why are you doing it? From the military's perspective, as children, as children, we love to know why. We need to know why. We need to know why so if we're told to do something and the situation changes and we can't talk to anybody, if we know why we're supposed to do it, we can still do it. That maybe modify our, our operation or modify our situation some to achieve the purpose. From a Christian standpoint, I don't. A lot of times we don't have that. We don't have God telling us why. We don't have someone saying, "Thou shalt do this," and there's no why to it. There's a why to it in the footnotes that uh, some people got together and said, "Well, we think this is why God said that," but God doesn't always say why. As a matter of fact, I would say he very, very seldom says. He just tells you what to do. Uh, when you have a commander, the commander checks in with you. He gives you an order. But sometimes you'll be operating for days or weeks or months with nobody telling you what to do. You're operating off that task and purpose. Every once in a while, your commander will check in and say, hey, Gary, how's things going? Great. 
or, oh shoot, I haven't told you I did this X, Y, or Z. You just kind of update them. That commander is a voice. He's coming into you, and he's, he's giving you guidance. He's giving you uh, a pep talk. He's giving you some comfort in certain times when you need that. He's giving you new direction. So you can kind of think of that as the Holy Spirit. In the military, in the infantry, we have something called a battle drill, where it's, a, it's an action executed without the application of a deliberate decision-making process. That's very military speak. It's basically, if this happens, everybody in that unit, everybody in that team will do this. We don't need somebody to say, hey, Gary, hey, John, hey, Bill, y'all do this, this, this. It's a, it's a, a reaction to something. Uh, it says, hold that thought. So next slide, please, Sonia. So God's, God's orders, we're going to go into this. So while we're getting ready to go into this, if you have your Bibles, please open up uh, uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 34, please. And we're going to talk about something, maybe not different, but just a little bit different as we've talked through a couple of these things. So what I, what I really wanted to do is not, not go through this, um, but just really highlight chap, uh, verses 33 and 34. So this is Jesus being questioned by some more Pharisees. Okay, there are, This is in a couple of other Gospels when they're asking him, what is the most important commandment? Okay, So Jesus says you know, to uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And with all your strength. The second is this. Well, he said, well, you should say, well, he said, what's the most important? Well, he's a, he, now Jesus is throwing out a second one. But he says, Jesus says, the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So he's not, he's not saying one and two. He's saying there is no commandment greater than these. It's love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Uh, the Pharisee goes on to say, this is what I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit more, is, well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. And then in verse 33, to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. So when we talk about burnt offerings and sacrifices, obviously we're talking about the law and how you would try to uh, make right your sin and stuff like that. Also in there is, you know, some of the Old Testament laws that are about tithing and stuff like that. I think Brother Roger has mentioned this before. Only about um, what two two point five percent, something like that, is given by the average churchgoer for their tithing. You know, the the ten percent that's in the Bible. If you really really look at it, it's it, it's not a straight up ten percent. You've got all different kind of offerings. You've got all different kinds of festivals. Uh, but I think, you know, Paul says it better is, you know, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. So we're not, we're not here to kind of push the tithing or not push the tithing. I think this Pharisee's point, and Jesus kind of confirms it, is that loving the neighbor as yourself is more important. You can give $10,000 to New Grove Baptist Church, and if you hate people, if you're a racist... If you are, if you treat people in a, in a bad manner, do you, do you think God is happy with that $10,000? I, I would say, I don't think so. I, I think God would be much, much happier if you gave him nothing, no money, and you were a loving person. You loved everybody. You showed, you tried to live your life in accordance with his commands and to the fullest degree possible. Um, and then Jesus says in, in uh, verse 34, uh, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Uh, so we just turn to the uh, Great Commission, please, real quick, for uh, Matthew. Okay, we're just going to cover a couple of things. So all I wanted to highlight for these verses really is on the last, last two, 19 and 20. Uh, Therefore, go and make disciples. So what is that? That's your task. You're told what to do. You know, that, is your, that is your mission. Go and make disciples. Does it, does it say 
why in any of the, the, the speech that Jesus gave to the Great Commission. It doesn't really say why. He's not giving you a purpose. He's just telling you what you need to do. Uh, then in verse 20 talks about and teaching them to obey, to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always. So Jesus is talking about obeying everything. Obey everything that he's commanded you. So we've talked about obedience. We've talked about uh, commands. We've talked about the Holy Spirit. Surely I am with you always. That's Jesus' Holy Spirit. So if you feel like you need some more guidance, pray for it. Ask for it. When you get that guidance, execute it. Do it. When your task changes, when, you, when Jesus says, nope, you're not going to Macedonia anymore, you're going back to Jerusalem. We should go back to Jerusalem. Uh, we'll kind of hold off on the, on the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Sonia. Uh, can you go to the next one? I got ahead of you guys here. We're on, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're right, commands. So the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Colossians you know, chapter 1, nine, verse 9 is, a lot of times as Christians, I think the will, you're, we're searching for the will of God. So in verse 9, it talks about knowledge of his will. The Spirit gives. You know, highlight those under this one. So if, if we're searching for the will of God, God's will is that we follow his commands. If we follow God's commands, we're, we are in the will of God from a broad perspective. If you're outside of God's commands, you're outside of God's will. If you are not following the Holy Spirit, you're outside of God's will. When I was fighting the Holy Spirit to not do this, I was, I was getting outside of God's will. I, you know, I shouldn't be as consumed about what's God's will for me and buying a new vehicle, a new truck. What's God's will for me for uh, what, what kind of house I need to build? Should I get a donkey full-size or a miniature donkey? That's not God's will. God's telling you what his will is. It's to obey his commands. It's to listen to the Holy Spirit. That's, that's, that's God's updated command to you at that point. It is, do this. Uh, we, we won't go into the Luke one because we hit Luke pretty good the other day. Other day. Um, the next slide's on you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and speed it up. I don't know if I can. Uh, so action. Action, serve as a verb. It's not, a, it's not a noun. It's a noun if you say, Don has a good tennis serve. That's a noun. Serve is to do something for somebody else, for some other organization, to, to provide them something. And that's what we do when we serve, uh, serve God. Uh, so in the military, you've got so much you have to do. You have to do things, action. If all we had was a military by name, we wouldn't be able to defend our country or exert our will and our national interests abroad. We, we wouldn't, we have to train, we have to equip ourselves. There's all these actions you have to do. The same thing with us as Christians. We are, we're told what to do, and we need to act upon it. Uh, so this Colossians chapter three, verse 17, uh, there's a lot of do's in here. And so it's uh, whatever you do, whether, whether in word or deed, and deed to do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So again, it's an action. It's what do we do? We do it for the Lord. Uh, so this self-reflection, just ask yourselves to what degree are you doing what the Lord is trying to tell you for his purpose. Uh, a lot of times we don't know what God's purpose is. Again, what, what you do is for God's purpose, and you may not know that until months, years later. Uh, indecision is a decision. If I don't make a decision on what the Holy Spirit is telling me to do, I've decided. It's not that I'm saying no. It's just I'm, I'm, I'm uh, backpedaling. So look at yourself. Look at us as a church. Look at us as individuals. Look at me as I backpedal for that Holy Spirit telling me to pray for this woman over her dying husband. I was backpedaling in that moment. Uh, I was being indecisive. And then I was doing exactly uh, what God did not want me to do. Uh, 
The true faith transforms our conduct. It's that, you know, faith in action. Having the, the faith to act upon what God is trying to tell us to do. Next slide, please, Sonia. Uh, serving as individuals or teams. What kind of, as you look through the top one, we'll kind of skip through those real quick. But it's, it's really, really hard to be an army of one. It's a, it's a team effort from everything that everyone does to uh, preparation to, to the mission itself. So for us as, as Christians, you know, as an individual, I love Miss Bobby. She is our prayer warrior. She can do so much as one individual for this church than any of us will ever know. She is praying over people, but, but you don't know it. And I think that's a, that's a really powerful thing that an individual can have a bigger uh, impact on us. Uh, as an individual, show non-Christians your love and the hope that they can have in Jesus. Uh, you can join an existing service effort. Just latch on to one. Uh, and teams, just as we go into business meetings, look at what you're doing for the church, what we're doing for our families, fathers, mothers, leaders. Lead your families to do something for the Lord, that, uh, the, a service project, a service action, and talk about it. Talk about why you're doing that. Maybe it's something that's put on your heart, and you want to continue along with that. Uh, next slide, Sonia. Okay, so we're going to try to put this all together. So this picture is in Iraq, 2008. And the, the dudes on my left and right all around me, probably six months before that picture, wanted to kill us. This, these were Sunni tribes that we were paying money every month, 100 US dollars, to not back Al-Qaeda to work with us. And so these were people that six months ago wanted to kill me. But yet now we're working with them. Now we're putting ourselves in a position where there's sometimes more of them with guns than us. Why were we doing that? Because they had a transformation. They saw that they were lost in their decision to uh, align themselves with Al-Qaeda. Uh, they lost their freedom. Al-Qaeda was taking control of their tribes and their way of life. And so they rebelled against that, and they needed America's blessing and help in that manner. So they were looking for freedom. Uh, we both had to have a sense of faith and trust in each other. We were trying to kill them, and they were trying to kill us six months before that picture. And so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty significant thing when you make an ally of someone that was trying to do something horrible to you six months before that. Uh, commands. Why did I do that as a commander? Because uh, I was told to do that. There was a purpose behind that. I was told to link up with these dudes, get with them, find out who they are, how they operate, and how you can help them to secure the area. And then they, my commanders backed off, and then we did everything else. Every once in a while, that uh, Holy Spirit voice of my commander, for lack of a better term, would come in. Gary, change plan. Do this. Yeah. Roger that. Do it. Move out. Uh, and it, it took... So many people to make operations happen. This picture was taken uh, after the guy on my right. You can't really tell, but he looks really angry because we just captured the guy that killed his eldest son and his wife at a, at a wedding ceremony with a suicide uh, bomb in a car. Uh, and then us all guys got together and <coughs> with them, and we just raided their house and captured them. And that was a way that I was building trust and and showing them that they could, I had an honor and I would go by my word and help them when I said they would. So next picture. Next slide, please, Sonia. We could throw out a whole bunch of things. This is just a picture of a random food drive. We could have used one from New Grove. We could have used a vegetable give out from New Grove. It's just a random picture. There's a transformation. Them as individual Christians. We don't just transform one day when we, when we uh, come to God and, and recognize God as our Lord and Savior, we transform daily. I'm still transforming as I grow in my spiritual maturity. We have a chance to renew ourselves every day, from the oldest person in the congregation to the youngest person. Every day is an opportunity. Every day is a, a new possibility. Uh, the people that need the food, do you have, do you trust them? Do you think they really need it? Do we judge them as, hey, well, I don't think these people need this. They got a nice truck. They don't need the food. Uh, but 
They don't need food. They need God. They need God in their lives. They need the bread of life. They don't need bread for one day or for one week or two weeks. That's not the purpose. The purpose of any ministry program is not about feeding people as the primary reason, the primary purpose. It's we're tasked to expose people to the love and hope of Jesus, to show them through our actions that there is a, uh, a God out there. You know, when we did this vegetable ministry last summer, people would come by and go, why are you guys doing this? Why are you giving out free vegetables? I don't understand. What's the catch? There's no catch. We, we, we want to share this with you. God blessed us, but we want to bless you. Uh, so, God's, command, God, God's given us the commands to do these types of things. We just need to act upon them. God's given us the uh, spiritual gifts, the talents. Those talents and spiritual gifts are not just for you. They're for other people. Uh, what do they need? Again, they need freedom. They need salvation. What they need. Last slide, Sonia. So in closing, uh, Romans 12, 16, again, you know, be willing to associate with people of low position. That low position could be anything. It could be somebody that has money that you don't think deserves something or doesn't deserve your kind word. But that low position is how they, that, what their values are. Not necessarily their, their excuse me, their, um, their, their quality of life, how much money they have. It's not, it's not about that. Uh, Think to yourself, how often do you obey your boss telling you to do something? How many times a day if you're at work and your boss says, Gary, do this? And you, yes, sir. Or after that, do it. How many times have you, have, do you get a situation where you know this is what God wants you to do, but you don't do it? How many times have you been in the presence of the Holy Spirit is pushing you to do something, pushing you to pray over this woman who just lost her husband and you don't do it. What, what, what an awesome thing we could do if we all, me, you, we, church, everybody, just did what we were told to do. Did our mission, did our task, and let God figure out the purpose and we'll find it out at some future day. We may never find it out. Uh, so in, in closing this last one, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. So we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That's what's going, what's going on when we act in accordance with God's will and obey his commands and loving our neighbors. People are seeing us as an ambassador of, of Jesus. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for all that you do for us. We want to thank you for... What you provide for us, all of the blessings. And we pray that we can share those blessings and the blessings of the time that we have, the blessings of our gifts. We pray that you can just make this a church that, that wants to serve, that desires to serve you, uh, just to bring others to you and to show them the love and hope of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.